So, so these are the disclosures. Next slide, please. So we talked about this, um, our, uh, and I'll hand it over to Haldi in just a minute, but next slide, please. Our chat moderator is John Lisko. This is supported by an unrestricted grant from Medtronic. And uh, next slide, please. And you can claim CME credits for this program. So without much ado, I'll hand it over to Haldi Wilson, who can introduce the first speaker, who's Yanis Chatsisis, and we'll I'll give Yanis 15 minutes and we'll follow with Shami. We talked about 15 minutes for robotics and about half an hour to Gotham and Juan to talk about simulation. Thank you, Adu. Thank you, Tanvir. And thank you all for joining this evening. It's an honor and a privilege to be here with you. And I think it's an exciting topic. I mean, this is one of those mountains we keep trying to get closer to the top as we'll be trying to climb to, you know, find the best way to do uh, bifurcations, and it looks like we're going to have some really novel ideas and technologies here this evening. So uh, uh, without further, uh, I'll go ahead and introduce the uh, first speaker, Giannis Tasisikis, uh, and uh, Giannis is going to talk about uh, the role of AI in computational simulations and coordinated bifurcations. Giannis? All right, thank you so much for the uh, invitation to be part of this. Let me um, uh, put my slides on the presentation mode. Give me a second. All right, so uh, can people hear me well and they can see my slide, right? Yes, we can. Okay, Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for um, the invitation to, to be part of this uh, forward-thinking session uh, tonight. Um, we're going to start with um, the role of uh, AI simulations and extended reality in, uh, in coronary bifurcations. Um, these are uh, all data and uh, evidence that has been published in this uh, review recently that came out in Jack Interventions. Um, let me start with um, the outline. We're going to start with uh, the introduction of the, these digital technologies, then um, uh, role of AI in cardiovascular interventions, role of simulations in interventions, role of exterior reality interventions, and finally, um, a little bit of forward thinking of how these technologies can um, change our uh, uh, interventional practice in the years to come. Um, ACER, this is the term that we coined in that review in Jack Interventions, where we encompass AI, computation simulations, and extended reality. We feel that they're all together under the same umbrella, and they're so interrelated. Um, let's start with uh, AI first. AI is uh, essentially the fifth industrial uh, revolution. AI is a computational tool, uh, like a mega brain, a computational digital brain that um, in a sense, can democratize the knowledge and allow the masses to have access to um, uh, complex um, um, uh, processes, which uh, otherwise uh, people would not be um, uh, easy to have access to. And um, uh, I'm sure that in the years to come, these terms of machine learning and deep learning and natural language processing and cognitive computing Computer vision will be uh, uh, become handy, um, and I'm sure that over the time we'll be using those terms uh, more and more. Um, obviously, AI is uh, deeply dependent on what we call um, big data. And um, uh, having said that, um, these are some uh, applications among many that illustrate how AI can help us with um, um, diagnosis of CAD, um, uh, how AI can help us with the diagnosis of the extent and uh, severity of calcium, um, also FFR, computational, and of course, uh, uh, some examples of uh, many that show how AI can change the game. But at the end of the day, this is essentially what's happening. We have big data as an input, which uh, feeds the AI system. And then we have an output, which is a decision-making, a diagnosis, a therapeutic approach, which at the end of the day 
uh, helps us understand better, diagnose better the uh, cardiovascular disease and find therapies that are tailored to our patients. And having said that, we talk about precision medicine, which is based primarily on AI. Um, up to uh, recently, we've been operating with one size, uh, one technique, one medicine fits all. But with AI, we have the unique ability to identify um, independent individual patient data and through this create subgroups of patients which can be best treated with specific uh, technique, with specific drugs, with specific strategy, or they can be diagnosed with specific um, uh, diagnostic approach. Uh, we switch gears now to the computation simulations, and I'm going to go a little bit deeper in that uh, realm. Um, simulations, as shown here, can be three types, live simulations, where true players, human beings, participate in a, in a true environment, virtual simulations, and of course, computational simulations where both the players and the environment are uh, fully synthetic. Computational simulation, uh, this comes from Wikipedia, is a simulation that runs in a single computer or better in a cluster network of, of computers. And this requires a computational model that simulates the real system. And that's a very fundamental uh, slide here, which shows that we have the real systems which perform uh, experimental um, studies and give us results. At the same time, we have the computational uh, models, which are the so-called digital twins, which imitate the real systems and they help us create, um, uh, produce simulation results. And those results are validated against reality. And as long as we have a real system, a, a, a realistic computational system, which is very close to reality, then we can use this for infinite, to test infinite scenarios, come up with new knowledges, uh, new theories, which we couldn't uh, come up with uh, otherwise using uh, real experimental uh, studies. These are some um, um, illustrative examples of how computational simulations can help us with uh, planning of procedures, whether it's coronary bypass, structural, and peripheral. And I'm going to go uh, through those uh, one by one. Uh, help us with the device R&D and, of course, with virtual clinical trials. Let's walk through the application of uh, simulations, computational simulations in planning of coronary interventions by failing to prepare or preparing to fail. This is uh, essentially the concept. We know very well that stands to some extent block again. They uh, were in need of uh, better procedures, more precise procedures. And what's better uh, in uh, a personalized pre-planning approach other than computation simulations, which is the most time and cost-effective approach. So what we do, uh, we have built through our NIH funding and patented this um, computation standing platform where we take uh, input as um, anatomy as input, any kind of uh, anatomical imaging, invasive or non-invasive. We create digital twins of the coronary arteries. We uh, deploy the realistic, space-specific materials coming from imaging. And then we enter the whole digital twin anatomy, biology, physiology into the computation simulation platform where we use realistic stands, balloons, and so on. And the outcomes here can be any morphometric or any uh, fluid dynamic or solid mechanics um, uh, information. These are uh, uh, just an example which shows that the combination of angiogram along with um, OCT, uh, creation of the digital twin, lumen and wall, then application uh, in the 3D wall of um, the uh, materials coming from imaging. And you see here distribution in 3D of, uh, of uh, calcium, of fibrotic tissue, and so on. And we went one step further. We translated this uh, uh, material 3D configuration into stiffness mapping of the vessel as shown here. And you can see we have a spectrum, not like a binary, from very soft all the way to very stiff, depending on the imaging. And um, here I'm going to show you now how this is translated into an actual clinical example, clinical application. Here is a case of a 60-year-old woman with a significant distal left main disease, as shown here by angio and, of course, by imaging. And what we did is that we stopped at this point. We took the patient off the table. We did create the 3D digital twin with the lumen wall, material properties coming from the ibus. Um, and then we entered the whole thing into the computation simulation platform and allow the platform to find, recommend the ideal stenting strategy, lesion preparation strategy, and stent sizing and position. And that was essentially what the, uh, the, the AI, the simulation, recommended. And then what we did is that we went back again to the table a couple of days later. And as shown here, this is the predicted, the recommended, if you want, technique um, by the simulation using this individual anatomy. And this is 
the what we executed, we replicated exactly the same technique as recommended by the simulation, pre dilatation, uh, left main standing to the LED, and then pot at the end. And as shown here, this is the baseline that's after the PCI uh, imaging, after the plant simulated, uh, all simulated, if you want, uh, PCI procedure, also by imaging before and after with a very good result. And we put together a series of cases and published them in uh, Jack case reports. I'm showing you here, I'm showing to you here another case with osteo left main. Again, digital twin creation, patient goes off the table. We do all the analysis offline, and then we go back to the clinical, uh, to the cath lab to deploy the same technique as recommended by the simulation. And this is uh, very illustrating. It shows this is the stent computationally deployed if you want in the left main. And that's what we did in reality, following precisely with the recommendation. You can see here, uh, both visually and also um, quantitatively, very high agreement between the recommended uh, technique and what we, what we actually executed in reality. So it works. And obviously we need more data to uh, in this realm, but the whole idea is to use uh, planning through simulations to plan better and more precisely our procedures. Another example here, application of simulations in uh, cabbage. Not only we, are, we can plan stents, but also we can plan our um, uh, bypass uh, uh, surgeries. We can uh, inform our surgeons, as shown here, how if we computationally deploy um, implant a graft, computationally, how the flow in the native artery in the graft is going to change. And this can inform the surgeon about the number of uh, conduits uh, and the type, because in a lesion which is not very significant, maybe we don't need a conduit, or if so, since it's a high chance to lose it if it's arterial, we can might prefer to do a, a venous graft to, uh, to achieve better uh, and longer term results. Uh, another example, structural, as shown here, there's uh, lots of work in this field as well. We can uh, recreate computation, the digital twin of the aortic valve and the aorta, and then find the right precise valve size position that works, fits best to this particular individual. Same for planning of uh, 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 clips and appendage occlusions. I'll show you here an example um, uh, of uh, a valve that's coming from a, a, a company which is called Peops. You see here, they have the software which can help us plan precisely what's the best valve positioning and sizing for this particular individual. Same concept with the left atrial appendage occlusion here. Each appendage is different and we need to identify precisely what's the best uh, size and what's the best uh, device type for each particular individual. Definitely the simulation help us here to inform us here to have better planning and hopefully better outcomes through the procedures. Uh, switching gears, to the application of simulations in uh, the device R&D, not only planning of procedures, but also device R&D, as shown here, simulations by, this is by the FDA, uh, play an important role all the way from the inception of the device to the regulatory approval and post-market monitoring. And as you can see here, this is by the FDA again, the performance of animal bench testing and then computer simulations on the performance of devices. As shown here, computer uh, simulations has lots of greens, particularly when it comes to cost effectiveness, time effectiveness, and ability to dial up, dial down, be more patient specific and uh, change different parameters to identify the, the right technique, the right device for the right individual compared to the animals and bench testing, which are more expensive, more time consuming, and they cannot be that customizable. To this, in that vein, this is an example, a very humble example of how a partnership of industry with this uh, uh, digital technologies uh, could uh, help advance the field of device R&D. This is the inception of Megatron. And you see here different prototypes, nine peaks, 10, 12, and that's the synergy. And we had the uh, opportunity to test those different prototypes before they come out uh, uh, to the market on different patient-specific digital twins, left main uh, anatomies, lumen, wall, and materials. To uh, again, uh, uh, we entered all these stand prototypes, different designs of the devices into the simulation platforms. And we found that of those designs, the 12 peak design, which is now actually the commercially available design, performed better in terms of expansion, scaffolding, radial strength, tissue prolapse compared to the nine peak device, the 10 peak design, and of course, uh, to synergy. Very important 
uh, example of how we can partner with industry and help industry advance the device R&D. Um, and then coming to re regulatory approval as well, the simulation can play an important role. We know very well that our clinical trials, which are the, the foundation of evidence-based medicine, also have limitations, increased dropout rates, increased costs, resources, and definitely an underrepresentation. And that's a big issue that we need to uh, tackle. We believe that virtual clinical trials in silico cl clinical trials can play an important role here. We have different devices, we have different techniques. What we can do is we can use uh, anatomies, not actual patients, but anatomies from very diverse population. That's uh, very important as well to address the diversity issue of the clinical trials. And then use uh, simulation endpoints, which are highly predictive of clinical outcomes. And through this virtual clinical trial approach, we can get a signal of the best devices and techniques, which can then test them in a more targeted, if you want, uh, fashion into actual clinical trials with real patients and real uh, clinical outcomes. But those clinical trials are more informed, more uh, uh, targeted compared to just uh, doing trials and spending money and uh, and time, which in many cases uh, can be uh, of no uh, real conclusion and no meaningful change in what we know. Uh, essentially, with the virtual clinical trial approach, we can inform the FDA, the uh, academia, industry, on uh, more specific, more targeted clinical trials, which can help us advance uh, the uh, science in a very cost and time effective way. And then coming uh, to the last part of my talk, the role of extended reality in interventions, a very important topic as well. We have different types of extended reality, virtual simulation, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. But at the end of the day, we have uh, uh, the ability to be like a red blood cell, in a cave as shown here and see everything from the inside. Uh, we can have the ability nowadays to see the whole procedure like a hologram in uh, 3D in front of us on the, in the cath lab and so on. And here we talk about essentially of branding a totally brand new uh, model of teaching using simulations and extended reality that can help our trainees learn greater, faster, and better. Here I'm showing you an example of a virtual cath lab which replicates our cath lab. And here, no x-ray, no contrast. You can use, that's my hand there, my finger, and play around, spend an hour, a couple of hours, and get to know how when you change the eye, the projection, how the uh, angiogram changes. I think it's indispensable experience before you go to the actual uh, clinical arena and apply uh, all uh, this uh, uh, all this knowledge. Um, through the simulations and the virtual reality, we can also learn uh, more about techniques as shown here. That's provisional. You, It's like us with a headset having a, a camera, like a red blood cell, and see from the inside how the stent behaves with the pod, with the kissing, and so on, what's the interaction with the carina, and, and so on. This is a decay plot. And again, we have, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to show you everything, but we have all these techniques all the steps, um, one by one, you can see from the inside how it works. That's a decay clot with a kiss at this point. And now ready to get uh, to, de to, to, to deploy the second stand. And after this, you're going to see here the pot. And then finally, we're going to come here and do the kissing balloon inflation. And then finally, the final pot. So indispensable knowledge that helps our learners learn, as I say, uh, greater, faster, and uh, better. And uh, finally, I conclude with uh, the concept of uh, how the cath lab um, and our interventions will look like in the uh, years to come. Um, and hopefully in the near future, we will be using any kind of invasive or non-invasive imaging that will feed uh, the uh, AI-driven algorithms for diagnosis. And then from there, we use computer vision uh, like the simulations that I showed you, to identify precisely the best technique, the best device for each individual. And then this fits the robot, which can deliver in a very uh, precise and very reproducible way the recommended technique by the simulation. And of course, hopefully, hopefully this can help us to uh, increase the guidance of the operator or, or, or the procedural guidance to the operators improve the catheterization lab um, uh, efficiency and workflow, 
improve patient satisfaction, um, improve the clinical outcomes, and of course, decrease the healthcare costs. More to come in this uh, field, but definitely that's a very interesting uh, concept that uh, might be uh, very popular in the years to come. And of course, do not underestimate that we have a lot of work to do. There's lots of limitations here, different biases related to data, to legal. Uh, if something happens, patient dies, who's responsible? The simulation or the doctor who might be uh, obviously not a bystander, but definitely uh, is not very active during the procedure. Uh, there's no tactile feedback. We still uh, have increased costs. Those things are not available um, widely. Uh, so lots of work to, to do, but definitely that's uh, uh, a possible um, uh, direction to go. So that's uh, the summary, essentially, uh, the graphical you, summary. Thank you so much, Janis. Thank you for your excellent overview. I mean, this is amazing. So in the interest of time, uh, Adley, would you want to go ahead and uh, introduce our next speaker? Uh, and we can talk. Certainly. Certainly, yes. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Tsitsi. That was a great uh, talk and a great introduction. So next uh, will be uh, Dr. Edisham Mahmood, who will talk about robotic bifurcation PCI. Edisham? Great. Thanks, Bradley. And uh, it's always a tough fact to follow after what Giannis has been uh, doing and teaching all of us. Let me share my screen. And I'm assuming everybody can hear me. Yes. Right. So Tanvir asked me to speak on robotically assisted uh, bifurcation PCI specifically. And it's, uh, it's a little bit of a challenging topic right now, as most people know. The one robotic platform that was FDA approved has recently been taken off market, but there are others that are uh, actively uh, reproducing the same concept. And uh, my hope is that there'll be some version of uh, Siemens reintroducing this. My relevant uh, disclosures are that I've consulted for Siemens and, Siemens and Corindus and done the clinical trials for robotic PCI. And the concept uh, originated uh, primarily to address the occupational hazards of interventional cardiology. This is an old slide, but it highlights in blue. If you've been working in the cath lab for more than 15 years, there are substantial healthcare risks to the operators as well as to the staff who work in the cath lab, whether we talk about orthopedic risks or multiple other medical issues. And the whole idea of robotic PCI was how can we <clears throat> minimize the occupational hazards of uh, our particular profession? So the first generation was what was called Core Path 200 and then the GRX. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of slides uh, talking about robotic PCI as far as the different platforms and the data. Uh, Tanvir wanted me to specifically share a couple of cases, uh, but I think as I share the cases with everybody, it's important to understand exactly what the robotic platform has. That's me sitting uh, at the table. This is the second generation device. You have three controllers. You can advance or retract the guide wire. That's the middle knob. The left knob that you see there is how you move the balloons or stent delivery systems back and forth. And on the right, the green knob controls the guide catheter. You can torque the guide catheter and you can also advance it and retract it. And you can sit in a protected cockpit that can be in a control room or in the cath lab, <clears throat> but you don't have to wear any lead. Important to understand, again, how the current generation system or the most recent systems look like. In red is the uh, in line represents where the guide wire is, and blue represents where the rapid exchange platform sits. Important to understand this because as uh, even the second generation robotic system was, it only had one active controller. So you could only control one guide wire or one uh, balloon or stent delivery system at a time with the robot. If you wanted to simultaneously do uh, two different stents, for example, you either had to move 
those in and out of the robotic platform, or you had to do part of the procedure manually. And this is the latest generation system. And the latest generation cassette is at the left bottom. Same concept. In red is the guide wire. In blue is the single system for advancing, retracting uh, any of the uh, balloon or stent delivery systems. And as you can see next to the cath table is the robotic arm that sits table side. So let me highlight a couple of really important, uh, valuable things that you could do with the robot. So you're, you're controlling the robotic drive from that control cockpit. And here's something, you can move that balloon back by a millimeter in a very controlled manner. And I wanted to highlight, in this case, uh, moving the balloon back a millimeter to post dilate a stent. And here's a left dominant system with an osteal LAD lesion and how we use the robot to make sure that we didn't have the stent too far back across the circ or too far in. So positioning the stent optimally at the ostium of the LAD, and uh, you can advance that stent as well as disengage the guide catheter, which I did here, to make sure the guide's not too far in and not too far back, place the stent, and that's, uh, uh, one of the tools that are available. And here's the final result for that osteal LAD. This is the case I wanted to highlight, and I'm going to walk you through the different steps. So we have the circumflex OM bifurcation, and it's a moderately diseased circumflex and more diseased OM. Both of the lesions were wired with the robot, so you had to move the wire platform back and forth. So wire down the OM, wire down the circumflex, pre-dilatation of the circumflex, pre-dilatation with a cutting balloon of the OM1. Here's what it looks like. Now to advance the stent, watch the stent. This is being advanced robotically. The guide catheter with that third arm can be advanced, and that's what I did here. So the guide doesn't move because I'm controlling it, and I'm advancing the stent into the circumflex over the active robotic drive. I deploy the stent, but now I've trapped the wire in the obtuse marginal. So what do we do? The next step is to flip the wires in the robot. Uh, before that, you have to dislodge the balloon from the stent. As you dislodge, you make sure the guide stays in place, and then you can go ahead and remove the balloon. So the balloon is advanced. Now we take the balloon out. This is again the whole, all of the cases I'm showing, I'm going to show you two cases, are done entirely robotically with one exception, and I'll highlight that. So now that OM wire is trapped. So I switched the drives. Now I am active in the OM. Uh, wire. So what do I have to do? Remember the OM wire is trapped behind the stent. So I'm removing it robotically. As I pull that wire back robotically, it sucks the guide in just as it would happen if you were doing it manually. So you pull that back and then we re-advance through the stent into the OM, kicked out the guide. We're able to advance the guide back in. Now I've got a wire that's through the side strut of the stent. I post dilate the circumflex stent. I am happy with what the way this looks like. And so I decided not to stent that OM and that's the end result. Now this next case I'm going to show you is a lot more complex. It's a 43 year old man, came in with cardiogenic shock, inferior MI. He had a known distal left main, uh, refused cabbage. He came in with the inferior MI, we looked at this right, we stented this, this was non-robotic, and now we're doing this next case robotically. And this should hopefully highlight all the different ways you can use the robot. Distal left main, but there's also a subtotal mid-LAD at a bifurcation with the diagonal. This is me trying to wire the LAD robotically. 
and just watch the one-to-one -one torque control on the tip of the guide wire. So one of the advantages of the robotic platform is that it grips the wire over a long extended portion of the wire out of the body. So when you torque the wire, it really transmits torque one-to-one. -one. I was able to cannulate and uh, through that mid LED subtotal, dilated and robotically placed a wire into the diagonal. And now we have a stent in the mid LED. Deploy that stent. After we deploy the stent, next what you see is that there's likely something going on in the distal LED. This is just a puff uh, beyond the stent edge. But more importantly, look at the diagonal. The diagonal was likely dissected when it was originally being wired. So now how do we manage that? The wire down the LED is on the robot platform. The wire in the diag is not, and there's a stent across the wire in the diagonal. This, by the way, I was doing a live robotic case uh, during one of the meetings. And so it was trying to demonstrate that there's a complex case you can do robotically. Now we had to figure out what to do here. We took out the wire from the side branch, rewired it into the diag, and balloon angioplastid was not adequate. Patient became quite symptomatic. And so at this portion, we went ahead with a non-robotic, meaning manual conversion, uh, advanced a stent into the diagonal, put a backstop balloon in the LAD, stented it, crushed it, bifurcation kiss back to the robot, distal stent take, taking out the diagonal wire. And now we have the first diagonal and the circumflex, both of which had wires placed prior to the stent that's overlapping to the mid LED stent back to the osteo left main. That stent is deployed. Both the circ and osteo diagonal look fine. Wires are removed. And that's our final result. So we stented the distal left main bifurcation provisionally, and we stented the mid LAD, uh, which ended up requiring a bailout stent into the diagonal. And that portion required manual uh, assistance. So from the standpoint of robotic bifurcation PCI, uh, what I can say is first, remember the robotic platform really does exactly what any individual operator can do. And so it, it's an extension of your own skill set. Uh, the robot does fix the wire, so it tends not to migrate distally or proximally and works very well for fine motor movements. You can use the robot to precisely position stents, especially when it comes to uh, osteo lesions or bifurcation lesions that you want to avoid a side branch. Uh, where I think robotic PCI works well is the provisional approach. So it's a superb tool for provisional BCI for the bifurcation lesion. But when you want to do a planned two-stent approach, the problem is that the robotic platform today only has a single drive. And therefore, if you want to put in two stents in two different uh, lesions, one of those two has to be done manually or you can go back and forth and move the delivery system as well as the guide wire in and out of the robotic drive, which can become fairly cumbersome. So uh, I felt very strongly that the future of robotic PCI uh, was quite bright, just required more infrastructure investment. We needed sort of multiple uh, drives to be able to do complex bifurcation lesion uh, PCI using the robot. And only then could you take data like what Giannis uh, was sharing with us. And if you could take those data sets and incorporate them with the robotic platform, you could end up with an ideal approach uh, to treat patients and avoid radiation to the uh, operator and team. With that, I'll stop and uh, we can keep moving before questions. Thank you, Edishan. That was another uh, 
great presentation, and I think we're all getting our eyes uh, opened up widely here. In the interest of time, we'll go ahead with the uh, third presentation, and then uh, hopefully everyone will be available for questions. I know I have a few. So the um, next uh, presentation will be from Gautam Kumar, and he's going to talk about simulation DK crush technique. And uh, Quan, are you also helping with this? Yeah, 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 yes. Yes, we're doing this together. Okay, yes. great. Hi, uh, uh, good morning or good evening on this side of the world or whichever side of the world we happen to be in. Um, I'm in Taipei right now, uh, presenting from the airport. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Rab, for this uh, opportunity and this uh, to be part of this very timely um, session. Uh, you know, it's a really hard act to follow those two phenomenal presentations by Dr. Chatzizis and Dr. Mahmoud on the future state. Uh, but I think what we, myself and Dr. Kumar, are going to do for you is to bring you back to a uh, technology that's currently available uh, and has been available for about a decade now, um, but, uh, you know, uh, has not achieved the kind of penetration we had hoped for to be able to uh, reach most people when it comes to training. But we want to show you what it's possible to do with, uh, with simulation for uh, training in bifurcation PC PCI. So... Um, just uh, from a, uh, a disclosure standpoint, I was involved in the de development of some of these modules uh, for, for mentors. So, I, so I, uh, I wanted to add on uh, something on behalf of Dr. Lee there. He was actually intimately involved in actually developing the bifurcation um, module in the mentor system. So that uh, lot of kudos goes to Kwan for that. You're being too humble with that, Dr. Lee. Uh, yeah, yeah, but um, I think uh, a lot of the work was also done by uh, the European Bifurcation Club, uh, Dr. Jens Larsen, uh, who uh, specifically uh, wrote out the step-by-step -step techniques. We decided for this demonstration, we would use uh, the DK crush, because as you know, uh, the DK crush technique has the most data uh, when it comes to randomized trials as compared to the other, especially in the left main subset. Uh, but it is also the most tedious and the most difficult to learn because there are so many steps and it's quite sensitive to, uh, uh, to experience with regards to outcomes. So um, here we are showing you uh, the current uh, uh, Mentis uh, state-of-the-art uh, VIS uh, G7 uh, platform. Uh, there are two versions of this. There's the VIS G7 and then there's a the VIS G7 Plus. And uh, as uh, Dr. Mahmoud pointed out earlier, many of these uh, platforms, uh, robotic platforms especially, struggle with what to do with the second wire. And so for many years, we had no option as to being able to build you a stimulated bifurcation model because we could not handle the second wire. But the engineers at Mentis uh, uh, were able to overcome this and basically built parallel channels that are able to interact with the wire, with the simulated wire that you put in. And so you are you can enter through a single uh, sheaf and yet uh, work on two separate objects. You know, so um, this is a basic setup here. Um, one of the main difficulties with regards to penetration has been the price point. As you can imagine, this technology is difficult. And until it's uh, widely disseminated, it will cost a lot. And so, you know, we're looking at six figures uh, for each of these things, which is why most fellowships simply cannot afford to have one of this. Um, at Sky, we are currently working on a uh, uh, updated expert consensus statement on training. Uh, the last uh, statement was in 2014, and we're, we're writing a new one for 2024. Uh, and hopefully we'll help you review and maybe move the line with regards to how do we get these simulators out to people. But um, it's quite basic. You have here on the on the right side, um, a, uh, the control panel. Uh, and then on the left side, you can see that they are the standard uh, 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 foot floral pedals, et cetera. And then you see the simulated virtual uh, 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 X-ray gantry and the andrographic films. So uh, Dr. Kumar, did you just want to give us the virtual uh, patient case presentation? Yes, this is a 65-year-old male who has hypertension. He is not diabetic. Um, he has been having six weeks of exertional chest pressure. He underwent a nuclear spec that showed a large area of ischemia in the anterolateral territory uh, with ECG changes, uh, I think, uh, at uh, a low exercise workload. And he has been on optimal anti-anginal therapy with uh, at least two anti-anginals and still continues to endorse persistent chest discomfort on exertion. Okay, so uh, thank you very much.
So here's the baseline angiographic picture. You can see that there is a, uh, you know, a Medina 111 uh, bifurcation lesion within the uh, proximal to mid LED uh, involving the ostium of a reasonably sized first diagonal supplying a fair pair tree. Um, you know, so the decision at this point, uh, without further ado, is uh, for us to uh, try and stent this. And we are going to choose for you a uh, DK crush technique, although I'm sure we could make uh, 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 cases for, 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 uh, uh, you know, a, a different bifurcation strategies here, but for this for this purpose, uh, DK crush. So, uh, appropriate use criteria, appropriate. Uh, you know, uh, we are intervening for um, symptom relief and not for survival. So this is what it looks like when we are selecting uh, objects. You know, the objects are not real. There's a tiny camera picture in the right hand of the thing that shows you what my hands are doing while I'm doing this. Um, here, uh, I've virtually selected a workforce guide wire and given it a specific angle for the first channel. Okay, and then I also have my CLS 3.0 virtual guide that I've selected here. So I think um, the important thing here uh, is that there is also a variation in the shapeability. You can actually see, if you look at these two wires, you can see that the tips have different angles as Dr. Lee pointed out. And I think that's an important part of this as well. Right, and you can choose between hydrophilic and workhorse wires and the wires do behave slightly differently within the system. I think one of the important messages also as well is that we have to be aware of what the system is capable of simulating for us and what is not capable of simulating for us. Uh, you know, Yanni showed very complex uh, stent behavior, et cetera. This system cannot do that, okay? It's mostly for you to uh, build in the reflexes for the step-by-step -step purposes. Uh, some of the things that happen in the system are not definitely real. Um, and so here we are, why we broke both branches, having selected a second wire on that second channel, um, and uh, the two wires are within that single sheep access point. So we decided to uh, use IVUS uh, optimization for this thing. We have an, uh, uh, an IVUS that kind of, uh, virtual IVUS that looks like a, an eagle eye platinum uh, with, the, with the markers. And then we're pulling back here. Um, there is, I don't think there's an automatic uh, uh, pullback uh, on a sled uh, version of this. So uh, this version is me doing a uh, hand pullback and recording. And so we've gone from distal within the LED, but coming back through. So we've uh, captured both proximal reference, distal reference, and cross the uh, thing in here. Now we're just showing you uh, the route, the type of uh, routine measurements that we might do. Gautam, you want to make comments? Yeah, and I think the, you know, conceivably this is a, nice uh, mapping of the main vessel that shows you, you know, the distal vessel sizing, the sizing at the uh, uh, polygon of confluence, the sizing at the proximal vessel as well. And here, I think we're using a caliper here. Uh, what are we getting there? Is it uh, 2.8? 2.8. Uh, yeah, 2.8. 2.8. Yeah. And I think you're going to the proximal vessel there to find a relatively disease-free segment. Yeah, uh, when we were working uh, on... When we were building these uh, uh, virtual models, we made sure to adhere to Murray's law. Yeah. Uh, Just the keep it. thing is that you're able to teach uh, fellows that, you know, these concepts exist. Uh, the, and, uh, you know, that stent sizing is very important in these bifurcations, as we have discussed on multiple webinars in the past. Right. So we have a 2.75 for the mid-LED reference and a 3.75 for the proximal LED reference. And then uh, we pass the IVUS into the diagonal. And I think we got a 3.0 for that. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, 2.75 for that diagonal as well. And so now we've, uh, you know, positioned uh, uh, two virtual uh, devices here. Uh, there's a stent uh, within the diagonal for the first part of the crush and the balloon, which is sitting in the main branch, ready to crush the, uh, 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 the diagonal uh, recently deployed stent. Dr. Kumar, do you have any comments about uh, making sure to get that LED balloon out? Um, yeah, I think we have to look uh, well at that point. And, uh, you know, the LED balloon is in good position there. So, yeah, I would go ahead and deploy the stent, like what you're doing. Right. And then oh, it's very important to call out that both devices are sized to the uh, the reference for the distal portion. Absolutely. Right? So, size to diagonal, et cetera. Um, the point I was trying to make was that the LED balloon should be parked and ready to crush. Don't forget to, some people sometimes forget, right? And they try and pass the balloon after the deployed the stand, and that can actually be quite problematic. That can be quite miserable sometimes. Yes, correct. And then um, here's a step where we are actually potting the front end. Not everybody does this all the time. 
And I think um, if you do, if you pot three crossing, you end up with better cross overall uh, because you don't want to go through uh, struts. Uh, Dr. Kumar, how do you feel yeah, about that? I think uh, this is an optional step, but uh, a lot of people do it. Some people don't do it. So this is an optional step at this point. But yeah, you could just recross in case. But yes, you will get the struts in the proximal part of the vessel out of the way if you do this step. Absolutely. Right. And then we are rewiring. Uh, and you've seen that we've gone past the the the, the stent pullback. Um, you know, uh, just to remind everyone for DK crush technique, the, the crossing point uh, is different than the other uh, techniques, right? Uh, the, the preferred crossing point for DK crush is proximal um, uh, for, for optimal results. Um, so one of the things that the system cannot do is it doesn't uh, simulate the stent struts very well. So whether you cross proximal or distal, uh, you know, you can't really, you don't ever really have that much control within the simulator. So that's important to point out. Uh, and, the, and the consequences of crossing at a different point with regards to resistance to, to uh, the, the balloons traversing the thing are not, are, are not well mapped out. You don't really feel that when, when this happens. Uh, but, um, you know, I think it's, it, it helps still. So this so is a picture of the public feedback uh, that you get back from the system hasn't quite caught up with uh, that part of it just yet. Yeah, for a bifurcation, especially, it's just too complex to simulate, right? Like Absolutely. how do you simulate wires wrapping around each other and the effect you, you would have, if, you know, your, your balloon, but it's just very hard to do. Um, the degree of computational power for that is going to probably be at least another generation now. Um, so this is the first case, right? Both balloon sized uh, and then, you know, sequential high pressure kissing. Uh, you know, uh, I think most of us like to do that instead of just just kissing. The most important thing about the kiss for all the beginners out there is that uh, you have to come down together at the same time. It's very important to not have asymmetrical balloons with regards to the lineup. Uh, you know, both balloons should end proximally at exactly the same point. The markers should be at the same point. I've seen people have a balloon kind of go halfway out and then another balloon in the, on, 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 on the main branch without symmetry. And, and that's not quite right. So now we are positioning the LED stand, having uh, done our first kiss. And of course, it's right. easy to cross at this point because you know, you've know you done your first kiss and that kind of makes it easier to get things across. Yeah. How do you feel about the wire being left there? Are you Any comments about that? Yeah, I, I, I personally would probably pull the wire at this stage. It probably would be better. Uh, there are people who leave it there and you know kind of deploy the stent a little lightly but definitely if you're going to pot after this step i would definitely get that wire out of there yeah um and the uh, polymer jacket or wires are better for this type of uh, for, for for leaving behind a stent so here we are deploying the led stent uh, i suppose it would have been nice for me to have blown this up a little bit but i was working by myself so i couldn't really pan too much and that's why I kept I kept the picture a little bit uh, zoomed out. But you can obviously zoom in as well, so you can see clear, clearly what's going on. Then we have a pot. Uh, very important when you when you are sizing the stent uh, for the lengthwise for the main branch. Uh, uh, just to remind the beginners here, you have to leave enough room for pot. Pot is probably the most important uh, 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 portion of your procedure to make life easy because if you don't pot the stent because it's sized for the distal reference it's possible for that wire when you're rewiring to end up behind the stent struts in which case your entire configuration gets destroyed if you if you don't if you're not aware of that and you're and you're dilating the uh, the um stent so uh we're yeah, we're, yeah we trap the wire. We're drawing the wire after the pot in this case yes 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 that's right <laughs> this is virtual so it's okay yeah. <laughs> but we are recrossing again here, proximal and again. We clearly didn't end up under a stent strut in this case because we were able yeah. to cross pretty easily. It's amazing. Dr. Kumar is so good. All right. And then uh, real know, life was this easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we're pre dilating with a small balloon within the simulation. If you end up using a, a, a proper size balloon, there is usually no resistance. Um, so, uh, but you know, it's it's good technique in real life. It's very infrequent that you can get down a, 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 a reference size non compliant balloon at, the, at this juncture. 
Um, so uh, we usually predilate before we go down with a smaller balloon. And then we're just positioning our kissing balloons. And here is the second kissing balloon inflation doing sequential high pressures. Um, the simulator has two indoflator side by side. Um, uh, you can digitally manipulate one or uh, use two, uh, depending on whether you're working by yourself or whether you are with someone else, uh, like in real life. So the, it, it has several options. So you, you can digitally inflate those balloons. And then, uh, Dr. Kumar, you want to comment about the final part? Yeah, I think the final part is a critical part here. Again, a lot of the comments that apply to the initial part also apply in the final part as well. Uh, sometimes if you have difficulty crossing with the final part, uh, sorry, I mean, uh, well, let's take a step back. Final kissing before the part, you may need to pre-dilate it with the balloon and open up the struts a little bit before you cross for the final kissing. Uh, the final part is a crucial step because it converts the ovoid uh, proximal segment into a round proximal segment. And that's been shown in multiple studies, uh, both uh, de novo and by OCT as well. Sure. Yeah. And so once again, remind everybody, uh, please be aware of what your shortest balloon in your lab is because that's the balloon you could be parting with and know that you have the full spectrum of appropriate diameters and sizes, etc. right? The other uh, a thing that, not everybody is always aware of is each stent platform has a different size, maximum size expansion profile. So a 3.0 millimeter uh, Osiro versus a 3.0 millimeter Zions versus a Synergy versus a, an Onyx, they, their maximum expansion is not the same for each of the size matrix. So if you're going to be doing bifurcations, you have to be aware of what the optimal, otherwise you start to induce a uh, significant deformation of the stand. You can get shortening and a lot of weird things start to happen. If you, if you, if you, if you don't know what your, your maximal stand size is, then you're pushing the stand beyond that when you're, when you're potting and reshaping for bifurcation. And then this is our final angiogram. And then uh, we passing the IVAS. For post -PCI so we know we can do IVAS at the end, uh, Dr. Lee, but can you do IVAS uh, in the intermediate steps as well? Yes, yes, you can do an IVAS in intermediate yeah. steps too. It looks a bit weird because the modeling for the uh, for the for the stent, um, you know, scaffold uh, is not quite perfect. So when you try to pass, and once again, you get no resistance when you pass the IVAS down. In real life, uh, if you don't quite get it right, you have a lot of resistance. Are you able to do OCT with Mentes as well? Yes, you can do OCT. The OCT, uh, uh, um, the output or the or the user interface doesn't. It looks quite uh, distinctly different from the uh, say the Abbott platform. So, uh, so I would say that of all the things that we have within this platform, it's the least realistic. Uh, that OCT output it looks more like this Ivers output compared to uh, the 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 Abbott output. And you can also do FFR, but I've never tried to use FFR for my uh, uh, bifurcation PCI evaluation. Obviously, clinically, we are all aware of all the studies in which you can use triporeal physiology to help you with uh, with bifurcation PCI, but um, haven't tried it with this yet. So, Dr. Lee, it looks like you have very nice results uh, with your DK crush there, and uh, that's a very nice IVIS as well as uh, angiographic result. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both yes, of thank you. So have you yes, thank you, Dr. Lee and Dr. Kumar. Uh, we just have just a few minutes left for questions. Um, so uh, I'm going to go back. We didn't have a chance to uh, back to Giannis Chassis. Um, Giannis, can you tell us, um, you said that in all these cases that you had to, you know, take the patient off the table for, you know, appropriate planning. How soon do you think we'll be able to do this online? That's uh, um, very well said. As we speak, that's our effort. I know very well that it's very unattractive for an interventional cardiologist to tell him or her that you have to take the patient to the table. Same for the patient as well. So at this point, we are having the computer power and the technology to operate uh, 
in uh, nearly real time within uh, a couple of minutes. The, uh, I the next ones will be able to be, to have all these these, uh, these technologies within a couple of minutes. If I can ask um, a follow up question after that, I think in the one study you said uh, you compared the simulation versus the, the reality of what you did on the table. So I guess I think the question with kind of any of these AI or new technologies, what, what determines the truth and how do you, how do you make that decision? Um, I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question well. Sure. So the simulation tells you your stent sizes and optimizations in your balloons. And I would assume you go in with that with that plan. But then when you're on the table, you make another series of decisions. Is that based off your intra-procedural imaging or how the case is going? Or how do you make those? Yeah. How do you yeah, recognize yeah, that? Oh, okay, I got it. So it's all essentially imaging plus. So the imaging we do, uh, whether we go off the table or in real time, is the foundation for the AI to recommend what we already uh, use as rules you know we have to size the distal uh, main vessel and size uh, and we have to predilate according to x or y z technique based on the calcium bed and so on so the ai essentially streamlines the, the the process and you don't have to take your gloves off go next to another console operate there for a few minutes do some measurement then come back and try to translate all this cognitive knowledge from the console to the angiogram so essentially the ai does all in quickly in nearly near real time and on the angiogram, so that you don't leave the table to go to to do measurements on uh, on the console of uh, imaging OCT or IVUS. So it's all based on imaging. So we don't introduce essentially anything new here, other than essentially a squeezing the whole lemon, which is called IVUS or OCT, which we don't squeeze nowadays, and get all the information which is hidden there and serving this to the operator in a very uh, uh, democratized way so that even non-experts uh, in imaging can have access to these technologies and can operate to, to the maximum. It's all really fascinating what, what, you, what you presented on. One, one question uh, on that with the imaging is, does the AI give you an idea of if you need to plaque modify and how to plaque modify? Yeah, yeah. it's the stiffness thing, which is very important. Um, as you, you, you mentioned, um, based on the lots of information we have on IVOS or OCT about the calcium fibrosis beds and so on, we can get a very reliable information, specific information about the stiffness. And as you know very well, the stents expand against a wall which has a certain stiffness. So the stiffness at the end of the day is what dictates the lesion preparation strategy. And this can be uh, um, a, a it kind of like this information can be uh, come available to the operator based on the AI, which squeezes all the information from the imaging. So uh, maybe uh, close to a final question to Dr. Mahmoud. I'd like to get him in here. Um, great presentation on the robotic bifurcation PCI and on the system. Uh, several questions in the chat about the cost and whether or not, you know, fellowships can afford this and, also about how uh, one program, I believe, Corindus uh, withdrew. Um, you know, what what are the plans as you see in the future? Are the prices going to be able to come down? Are these going to be affordable? Um, is there going to be more than one vendor in the market? How do you see the future, Dr. Mahmoud, in this uh, technology? Yeah, Hadley, you know, great question, and I think a not a straightforward one to answer. So Corindus, which was uh, acquired by Siemens was the first to market and that was about a half a million dollar capital expense and then a per case or a disposable cassette that was four to five hundred dollars uh, something that is affordable by health systems but the value at a patient level was never proven uh, it was predominantly at the physician level and i think uh, there's still work needed to be done i do think there's a big overlap between that technology and what Mentis has. And I think for training uh, fellows, uh, this is really a superb tool because you can simulate a lot of complex lesions without actually uh, you know, training on patients. As far as uh, where things are currently, I know that there are multiple companies, including Philips and uh, a company that I know of are uh, basically variations of the same concept. So my 
what I would anticipate is over the next two to five years, we should see multiple vendors in this space. And as we integrate other data and knowledge that we have acquired, uh, we have to figure out, and these vendors have to figure out how to better utilize this technology for patient care and physician education. So uh, my guess is we're going to have between two and five vendors over the next two to five years. So Hadley, you know, you gave us a great talk about uh, the investments as a leader of the American College of Cardiology. You talked about where ACC was looking into all these areas of technologies. So can you make some comments from your perspective on the many different vendors you've looked at and what where the college is headed in, in, uh, in the area of AI and future of cardiology? Well, sure. Briefly, um, one thing is uh, I think uh, we need to look in this uh, interventional arena, you know, for uh, AI as well. And I, I think uh, ACC has, has not done that well enough. And I, I don't know if Sky is, is uh, you know, other than just individuals like your leaders that have done this. But uh, we do have an ACC innovation department and, uh, you know, led by Ami Bot. She's done a terrific job. And I'm, I'm certainly uh, open my eyes. I'm going to let her know about all the work that's going on in this area and, uh, you know, see if uh, ACC can help, you know, potentially partner or consult or whatever with some of these uh, companies uh, because this is, this is uh, fantastic uh, technology of uh, the future that we hope will be the present soon so um most of the acc has done though it has been more on you know clinical uh more like uh with um, just you know remote monitoring and with um also with um, you know electronic health record and, and other things that you all are aware of as well shami as the leader of sky you had started this program into the investment with juan and, and mentis and all where do you see sky-headed, I mean, in, in these areas? I think, you know, Tanvir, conceptually, the professional societies are clearly uh, very, very important partners and can direct where uh, the future should go for both our patients and our physicians and uh, physician health. I know that that's one of the big things uh, that Herms, as the next Sky president, has on his agenda. Uh, occupational hazards for our profession. But we don't have the financial resources to be able to execute uh, some of these new technologies. So best way for us is to define the agenda and find appropriate partners in industry and the government and see if we direct it to appropriate investigators as well as partner with the right vendors in the commercial space to uh, further develop these technologies. I think AI is the broadly speaking uh, integration knowledge base into the practice of interventional cardiology. So, you know, as OBLs get to be more common in the next year or two in this country, we'll need to have our trainees learn things like the mentor system and integrate what Yanis and all are, are working on to try to get this all married together. With the future of interventional cardiology, you will really be headed in this direction. And I see that happening and how you do quality control in the OBLs, how you train people our training programs. All this will be tangentially affected as, you know, all these things start happening in our country you know, sooner or later. So I completely concur. You know, when we did the tr advanced training statement for coronary peripheral and structural interventions that got published uh, last published year, or, uh, we felt that simulation training is going to be crucial as new devices, new techniques come out, we we just don't have the bandwidth to train everybody uh, in a fellowship. And so a lot happens post fellowship. And clearly this is this is one of the ways to do it. John Lisco is a fellow coming out of training. Do you have any comments and any questions that you have to go to the chat box that you want to answer? And how do you perceive all this? And then we'll yeah, as, as a fellow coming out, I mean, I think this is all fascinating, right? Because there's so much pathology that you hear about. And I think it, you don't, you're, at the mercy of what comes through the door when you're in the lab that day. And I thought the simulations that Dr. Chatisa showed of the stent expansion actually being in the vessel were fascinating. How have your fellows uh, responded to that and in, in using the simulation technology that you have? Um, 
So we've had a, uh, we've tried to buy the machines because, you know, the problem with the the price point uh, that we have right now, it's very difficult to house a simulator uh, uh, at your site. And in the past, what we had to do was actually organize training uh, uh, events where we would then bring uh, roving machines to a single spot and then have the fellows work for uh, a day, for example, on all the different simulators uh, on, a, on, on a single day. The issue there, however, is that, um, you know, can you, uh, is retention good when you just are exposed once, uh, you know, a year? That's just not good enough. And so what I tried to do at both the University of Arizona and Mayo Clinic Arizona was to actually have a simulation center with these machines in close proximity to the cath labs. Um, and our fellows uh, have the opportunity to work by themselves. But once again, another important paradigm there is training is most effective when you have a senior intervention standing next to the fellow as they're working. We try to build uh, self-learning modules and props throughout the, uh, each of the cases, but you know it's just not quite the same. And we come backwards full circle to the same fundamental problem that there are not enough of us who have enough time, who are paid enough to be able to stand there and you know train at this uh, quantity. And I think um, uh, a future application of artificial intelligence in, in being that mentor while people are working might be another interesting uh, uh, line to take so that we can lift off the burden of uh, uh, experts having to you know, spend hundreds of hours with uh, learners. Yannis, as the president of the Sky Bonification Club, any final comments? And I'll pass it back to Hadley to close it out. Yeah, um, I I believe that as you very well said here today, and we have a panel of uh, several fellows as well. I'm sorry, like an audience with several fellows. We need to nurture the next generation using uh, being uh, not being afraid to use um, imaging, of course. And that's the least. It's not success to to use imaging. We need to nurture the next generation to be, not be afraid to use new technologies to be receptive to innovation to be receptive to new software and hardware that can help us deliver more precise and more efficient and, and at the end of the day, um, faster and uh, uh, finally, why not more affordable care for our patients? Yes. And you know, we can do anything about imaging. And today, there's a meta-analysis published in Lancet of 15,000 yep. patients really show that IVAS or OCT is superior to angiography, you know, and that needs to really, really be escalated. So I'll leave it to Hadley to finish it off. So Hadley, take it on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tanvir. Yes, this has been uh, really a fascinating uh, webinar here. And I hope everyone has also been able to tune in to the chat because there's been some great information about uh, the benefits of this technology and, and conversion factors. And also even earlier on, uh, a little bit of a survey look about like half of folks were using CTFFR in their institutions and others uh, not so much. So uh, it's been really fascinating and I think uh, it's also been uh, humbling because we, we also see the challenges and some of the obstacles uh, with this technology but also realize that if we can uh, implement it in a uh, cost efficient, time efficient way, it'll be a great learning tool for our fellows as well as for us and also and of uh, a lot of advantages for clinician well-being or interventional cardiologist well-being uh, as well. So uh, great talks. I want to uh, thank and compliment uh, Dr. Francis, uh, Dr. Mahmoud, uh, and also Dr. Kumar and Dr. Lee for their presentations and all of you for tuning in. And uh, thanks so much for having me as well. And thank you, Dr. Rab. Thank you very much. And to make a pitch for our next webinar on March 28th, you are Bill Nicholson and company regarding talking about CTO modification PCI. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Good evening. Thank you.